Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Tim Branham. Tim Branham is managing partner at Branham Advisors. Mr. Branham has served as chief strategy and growth officer for a healthcare services firm, chief technology officer for a publicly traded automotive digital marketing company, and global CIO for a global information telecommunications services company. Through these experiences, he's had responsibility for hundreds of staff, millions of dollars in P&L, and was a key contributor to the company's bottom line. Tim is a veteran of the United States Army, having served as an Airborne Ranger in the 3rd Battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. He's an instructor and senior member of the World Martial Arts Federation, as well as an avid golfer, rock climber, and self-defense expert. Tim currently lives in Dallas, Texas with his wife and two children. Tim, I am so excited you're willing to join us on the show today. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it as well. So why don't we just dive right in? Tell me, in your mind, what is innovation? So I knew that question was coming because I'm a big fan of the show. So of course, <laughs> you know, I had to write it down so that I don't screw it up. But uh, really thinking through it, I think you know, over 35 years of working in innovation from private sector to public sector. I think innovation, it's a, it's a system of change that's based on measurable, demonstrable, positive impact. And that impact could be profits, could be defining new markets, could be products, or could be even uh, new customer segments. But it's systemic. Mm. It's not just a flash of brilliance. Innovation, many times, you know, if it's the, the latest, greatest idea, someone says, hey, that's our innovation. Or I see a lot of companies try to find a person and they say to that person, you lead our innovation. Right. But that's not really fair to anyone to sort of hang that sign around their neck. Right. Innovation where it's really systemic and can really be a common a thread throughout a company. That to me is where you really see the impact and the change. Mm. Yeah. I love your definition because it's built around impact. Mm. And the reinforcement of the systemic nature of it is so, so important. Can you go back through the list, the kind of three or four elements you kind of laid out at the beginning? I want to make sure we we talk about each of those. Mm -hmm. The easy one is profits, right? And, and mm -hmm. if I've worked for a lot of large companies, you know, and, and the sort of the first measuring stick is always profit. Yeah. And I had an interesting conversation with one of my uh, customers even this morning. And they were talking about how it, uh, it's really difficult to get funding for innovation. And when I think about that, I do think of that's sort of the paradigm, you know, the old paradigm of sort of R&D and then R&D as a percentage of revenue and that funded innovation. And that's how a lot of companies got, you know, patents and sort of, sort of in an intentional way, sort of invented new innovations in their company. But I think what's interesting about it is there are technologies, especially my background is heavy in technology. I see a lot of ways where technology can drive efficiency and that efficiency is seeing returns and those returns are coming so quickly mm. that sometimes these innovations become self-funded. Yeah. So you create a roadmap, a self-funding roadmap of innovation. And so then you're not really going out to a board and you're saying, give me a million dollars. I want to innovate. You could say, we think we've got a, a system of, of, to innovate that can drive profits, but we need to get a start. Right, right. And that's the systemic aspect of it. Because if, it, if it's systemic, then the previous innovation, so to speak, you know, you, you say, we're going to take that profit, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to reinvest that into the next iteration of, or the next innovation or the next project, the next big thing. And those things, as long as they keep kicking out profit, become self-funding as long as you draw the circle big enough, right? Right. I think what you're alluding to is from a budget standpoint, people tend to draw the circle around R&D mm -hmm. or draw the circle around the innovation department. And nothing's going to be self-funding with that mindset. Or if they just harvest the profit, if they just harvest the profit, it goes at the bottom line and then they forget about it. Right. Then again, it isn't systemic. I think the other thing that's really interesting is is when you start seeing innovation in products or even markets. And you know, healthcare is pretty interesting. Healthcare and even some of the um, older finance, whether it's you know wealth management or even consumer banking, but there's mm -hmm. still 
this laggard sort of mentality around how technology can be uh, an enabler for that business. That business is still very personal. It's very relational. It's very you know, patient care, hands-on. But there's opportunities there to do a lot of acceleration through things like use of cloud automation, some of the deregulation that's going on, or some of the things you know, like around HIPAA or around high trust that were just huge barriers to entry to innovate. Right. We've now found ways to meet those objectives as, as high as those bars are, or FedRAMP or you know, federal government or DOD. They are now technological ways to still meet those regulations, but still innovate. Mm. If we keep building that sort of heart for innovation, always trying to do better, provide a better customer experience, trying to you know, think outside the box, we can always find solutions for those barriers, but we have to be willing and committed to, to search those out. Right, right, right. And I think the distinction I'm hearing in what you're saying is there's almost, and I'm just going to make this up, but there's almost capital I innovation where you've got a person with a, you know, a title on a door, but there's lowercase I innovation where it is a way of kind of way of operating, a way of thinking. You talked about making things better. And that is something that can happen in any function, any part of an organization. It can also happen as a matter of just forward progress through technology. So innovation, you know, a lot of times technology and innovation get used interchangeably almost. And I want to move ahead. When we move ahead, I want to talk to you about that in particular. But I'm definitely hearing kind of a difference between labeling someone or some department or some part of the organization as the innovation team or owner right? and you leveraging innovation as a skill set. I think a good representation of that is you've probably heard this term a thousand times, digital transformation. Mm. It's become this amorphous, unobtainable goal <laughs> of investing millions of dollars in technology and process change and people, but it becomes so amorphous that there's not a really well-defined goal at the end, right? then you can never get it. And I've, I've sat down with executives from you know, MGM and from uh, Harrah's and from big corporations that have invested you know, millions and millions of dollars into digital transformations. And what they learned along the way is they did find some significant benefits from some of the things they were doing, but it's almost never what they set out to do in the beginning. Right, right, right. And I think it kind of goes with the innovation thinking, which is, is it measurable? Mm -hmm. Can you demonstrate success? And can you demonstrate measurable success early and often throughout the process? Because we are no longer in that thinking where we can wait seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 months for a project to finish before we see a result. Right. We need to know that our money is getting a return, you know, in days or weeks. And sometimes, you know, that's kind of the whole agile nature of business these days is. I want to see something every two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. and it's tough to do that with technology. You can do that with business, with process. I think you could do that with customers and products. But the larger that change is, the more difficult it is to show that demonstrable return in that short period of time. Sure, sure. If I think about digital transformation, because I see that phrase a lot. I know you live in, <laughs> in that world that have to deal with that phrase a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you help people think about digital transformation as it relates to innovation as a skill set? Because what I've found is when people say they want a transformation, what I hear them saying to me is I want a process or structure that's going to keep me relevant, mm. but which is slightly different from approaching your business problem with an innovation mindset. So how do you think about that? Well, you hit the nail on the head. I think part of it is the definition. You really have mm -hmm. to define what that transformation is and what, what they intend for it to do, because it could be you know, it could be, I know that you do a lot like in CPG and supply mm -hmm. chain, and it could be, you know, really improving a process from, you know, the bill of materials to finished goods to shipping. It could be process oriented, which is where a lot of this started. And those processes started to be manifested into systems and workflow and robotic automation. And, you know, and it just right. seems like there was just always a better mousetrap to sort of do those processes, but you can't decouple from the knowledge of those industries and those processes because that's where you're going to find the, the efficiencies, especially in the digital transformation. What's challenging about that is it, it doesn't impact any one department. Right. Like I do a lot of digital transformation that are related to marketing. 
Well, marketing impacts sales, it impacts operations, it impacts legal from a compliance perspective, it impacts everything. Right. And so you have to make sure that if it's a transformation, first of all, there's sort of like the big T, just like the big I, right. that transformation is going to impact a lot of different constituencies within a company, mm -hmm. but also their customers or suppliers and all that too. So it's putting the right time into definition, having the right stakeholders and having the right sort of buy-in and understanding, a thorough understanding, not just a rubber stamp, but sure. really understanding that if we, we go on this journey, it's going to take a lot of time, going to take a lot of our resources, it's going to take a lot of commitment, it's going to take a lot of money. But you know what we're committed to is the definition of the outcome at the end. And a lot of times, as you also hear the, in the transformation, it's sort of a keeping up with the Joneses. It's you know I'm going to do this digital transformation because my biggest competitor has already gone through and done this, and there's this perception that they're kind of bigger, faster, better, cheaper. But it isn't always the, the case. Hmm. But you see things like a chief transformation officer, that's becoming a, a pretty big title now, or the chief digital officer is picking up this all things sort of transformation. But the success, I mean, true success, and at least over the last 10 years, when I've seen these big transformations for large companies in you know, airline and electronics and high tech and, and healthcare, mm. those transformations that were successful had teams that spent the time to get the true definitions of what they were impacting and changing, who all the stakeholders that were gonna be involved in their impact points, Strong, what we used to call Marcom plans, marketing and communication, that's internal and external. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? When's it coming? How will it impact you? So that that adoption happens in a way that you actually get to your stated benefits versus having people fight it because it's the new, scary, shiny thing. Right, right. That's a great perspective on on that. And it can only come from someone who's kind of been inside that world of, you know, transformation because we... We, from the outside looking in, see the title, we see the term, you see the announcements in the various news portals in terms of X company is, is undergoing a $80 million five-year digital transformation right. or whatever. And you just go, okay, <laughs> what, what does that mean? But that's really a great way to unpack it for me and I'm sure for the listeners. You ever notice that how nowadays most companies, I, I can't even think of the last one, they don't talk about investing hundreds of millions or tens of millions of dollars in anything anymore. I think, I think yep. there's so much risk in actually getting <laughs> to something you can say was successful at the end. It's almost like they'll tell you after the fact if it was successful, yeah. but they won't tell you what they spent beforehand. <laughs> those old days a, of the big government contracts or the big spends, I think yeah. those are those are those are gone. That, that's such a great point. It's such a great point. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think a lot of it is probably the pace of innovation in the ecosystem. Various different ecosystems. You you touched on a few of them. My brothers and I have been talking a lot about digital streaming lately and the rapid evolution of that. You know, Disney announcing that they're going to at an ad supported level and other elements. Uh, you know, kind of coming into the streaming ecosystem and people having to react and respond to those things. So as you think about the pace of how those things are changing, you almost don't know what you don't know. And so just saying we're going to undergo a digital transformation or, you know, transformation of some type is almost like saying we're going to look into this and we're going to look into it for a period of time, but we don't know what we're going to find. And subsequently, we won't know how much it's going to cost. And I wonder how, how you go about, I don't want to say staffing, but what do you look for in a chief transformation officer? You know, how do you think about that? And, and what does that mean for innovation? Those titles are tricky. I, I, you know, those I would run from those screaming myself. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I think if uh, if you really were trying to fill a role, I think the number one thing there is is enterprise organizational change management. That person mm -hmm. has to understand change at scale. Yeah, because it isn't ever going to impact one department. It's not even going to impact just within the company. It's going to impact again your customers your suppliers, your market, your industry, the regulators, depending on which industry you're in, that is such a large change oriented role. And that person has to have, you know, the direct ear of the CEO. It's mm -hmm. not something that could be at arm's length. I mean, the, the critical success there is you're going to learn things. You're going to run your nose into the wall and you're going to learn things and you're going to want to give that transparency very quickly. So you can either pivot and do something different or lean into it 
find a way through it, find a way through that wall and keep going. Mm. Transformation is never easy because change is never easy, right. but it is constant. You know, we've heard that all throughout our careers. Change is constant. You know, now you think about the price of gas and how much that's gone up just in the last three days, right? Yeah, yeah. There are unprecedented things happening in our economy with our the valuation of our currency and mm. global events and things. You know, we used to look at change, you know, in horizons of three to five years. Right. Think about how much change we consume in the course of six to 12 months now. Right, right. And so I think that's where big T transformation is scary to me because it's so unpredictable. Mm. But if you can create a good system, an innovation or a transformation system where you can define experiments and fail fast and pick winners and losers and then incrementally invest more and then gain on those wins, I think that's the smarter play. Mm. It's smarter to do that, whether it's a big company or a small company, because then you're building on success. Success will beget success and you'll, you'll see that grow. And there'll be opportunities to maybe double or triple down and, and ramp that change much faster. Right. But you're doing it from a much better position of knowledge versus sort of going all in on, you know, we're going to do a complete new website and complete new e-commerce and we're going to digitize and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, our entire supply chain and we're going to do all these big massive moves. You're going to get pretty heavily committed financially and resource wise with your people and their time before you really see any return. And, and again, with just looking how fast things are moving in our world today, uh, I don't know many companies that can afford to take that big a risk. Yeah, well said. It's not a um, three to five year planning horizon anymore. Yeah, I don't see us coming back to that world anytime soon. And I think the sort of unpacking of your definition of innovation led us to transformation and that discussion around, you know, what does that look like and how does it relate to innovation? Now, I'd love to learn from you, what isn't innovation? Mm. You know, that's, that's an interesting question. And, and uh, I've actually heard a few of your guests answer that. And I, I would mm -hmm. say I have sort of, ha I sort of align with their thinking and I probably can extend it on my own. Mm -hmm. um, what isn't innovation is iterative change or just adaptation for what's in place. Now, sometimes iteration and ad ad adaptation can add some pretty significant benefits. I'd say that it's the exception, not the rule that you would find innovation via those means. Right. But what's tricky about innovation is you're looking for something, I'd almost look at it like a paradigm shift. Trying to create a culture of there's no bad ideas. Right. As crazy as it might seem, we want people to feel that they've got a place to communicate, to register, to submit you know, these ideas and get their contact information and almost create a backlog that you can look through and prioritize and loop back with them and sure. create this fertile ground where you know a good idea is going to come as a result of being in that that form or fashion but when you create it as a if you try to create innovation as this sort of against the grain against the culture we're going to do innovation you know come hell or high water <laughs> kind of thing right if you try to force it it almost goes against all of that creativity and ability for people to kind of bring their unfiltered ideas. Mm. So I think that there's, there's a lot of risk of that. I've worked for some really big companies, you know, like Fujitsu and, you know, where they have some of the best R and D minds in the world, mm. Siemens, uh, same thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's almost like having a record deal, right? <laughs> if you're going to spend a billion dollars in R and D, you better come up with some pretty good ideas. Right. And, and I think there's gotta be a lot of kind of weight on those people to come up with these massive sort of industry changing ideas yeah. versus, you know, maybe again, creating this culture in this system where we know you've got good ideas out of 2000 or 5,000 or 10,000 or a hundred thousand employees. If everyone submits one or two ideas a year, you know, out of that, if we get five great innovations that could do X for our company, I think that's where I'd love to see more business to sort of gravitate towards. Mm, I see. So, so less about the sort of incremental, iterative, step-by-step -step thought process and more around, let's get all these ideas together and be really good at filtering and elevating and prioritizing to really suss out the value. More breakaway than bolt-on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well said. Well said. I got that. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the sort of bolt-on approach almost carries a sort of a false sense of security with it. 
Mm. Because I, I think what you're bolting on to is something known, something understood, you know, it's like, okay, well, if I'll just take this one step away from that. And, you know, I can still kind of see the shore, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably the allure of the bolt on approach. And, you know, we can call this innovation. It's different. It's new, but you're not out doing the deep sea fishing where you catch the big ones. But if you're not careful, that becomes tech debt. What happens so often is people, they make an investment and then they add, and then they add, and then they add, because again, it's comfortable. Then all of a sudden, this is very inflexible and to do simple things. It takes, oh. you know, it takes an army uh, to figure out how do we make this this sort of kind of Frankenstein thing we just kept adding on to, you know, shift and change into this new direction. So again, that's why I think we've got to get people to think it's okay to think of a completely new way to do something. It's even okay. I've been on this sort of um, rant lately about componentization mm -hmm. and especially in big and bigger enterprises, getting people out of the thinking of, I need to go buy this next new shiny thing. And it's usually a, right. a product, a software. I'm working in a very decentralized customer right now and, and uh, their field can go out and buy a CRM or they could go out and buy a uh, contact management or a telephone system. And, mm -hmm. and that has just created this, this immense uh, overspend in technology, but more, more importantly, an inefficiency where they're not really getting the benefit of a central customer point of view and being able to you know, market against the customers and, and, and see intent and see, you know, product analytics and things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to work with them thinking if we could talk to the business in terms of what would you need to do your role better, consume that, and then see with all of the things that we've invested in, where can we best provide that service? Don't tell them that we're going to go buy XYZ software or XYZ system, right? but we're going to give them that service, service as a service based on our existing investments and our existing portfolio. It does two things. One is it sort of empowers the technology organizations within companies to learn the business better. Yeah. Um, and it sort of frees the business to be bringing those ideas because they're the ones talking to the customers every single day. Right, right. So everybody wins because they become more attuned to the ultimate goal, which is to make the customer successful, whether it's B2B or B2C. Right, right. That definitely moves everybody in that positive, in the right direction. That's an interesting take. I wouldn't consider that a rant so much as a well-considered point of view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've whiteboarded. I actually bought an eight-foot whiteboard that uh, pretty much the length of my room because I'm yeah. visually impaired. If I can't see it, I don't understand it. And so I was whiteboarding for a couple of days until I finally was able to get a view that uh, helped me communicate to multiple different people within the organization from the executive suite down to the field. And, and when I started seeing the heads nodding, I'm like, okay, this must, we must be onto something here because everyone seems to be getting a good common understanding and it's taking down hurdles. So it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good thing. And you can't have too long of a conversation about innovation without a whiteboard coming up. <laughs> so, I can't anyway. I, I mean, neither. Uh, my hands are taken off on its own. Me neither. Mine is uh, two sided. So <laughs> I am a whiteboard devotee for sure. For or just clarify for, for me and others, what you mean when you say tech debt? What does that phrase mean? Oh, tech debt. It's when you, instead of thinking of fresh new ideas, which could may or may not mean fresh new spend of dollars, you feel like you have, you're sort of, um, you've got to work with what you have because you've had it forever. And that could be technology. It could be, um, I'm trying not to get too technical, but sure. it could be physical technology, you know, router switches, hubs, networking equipment. It could be mm -hmm. desktop servers. It could be applications. Usually it's applications where, you know, I went out and bought SAP and then I have to solve every problem now through the lens of SAP because we spent so much money on SAP right, right. versus thinking, what is a problem we're trying to solve? Is it performance management or is it a 360 view of our employees? Is it succession planning? These big software packages and platforms do provide a tremendous amount of value, but there are all these other small companies that are innovating constantly. Mm. Um, I used to be a CIO when I was in the Valley and you can only imagine, you know, I had people knocking on my door pretty much every week. Right. And, uh, you know, things that we were trying to solve within our huge massive invested uh, technology base, they would come in and they would take a thumb drive, stick it in and say, hey, look what we just solved. And we're like, <laughs> our minds are blown because, you know, they probably had 20 or 30 developers here and offshore. They probably built this, you know, in, a, in six months and they're going to get their Series A funding. And it's absolutely brilliant. 
but we've spent $30 million on our thing mm. and we can't make it do that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so technology debt is where you just become inflexible because you just keep adding, bolting on more and more and more sort of modules and you stay stuck in your, your frameworks and your thinking without opening up your mind to other potential ways uh, to add value to the company. And I think it's getting a little easier, uh, getting a little better for companies not to go down that path because of uh, the use of things like APIs and, and service frameworks where sure. you can really connect to anything. You can you can enrich your experience by connecting to these technologies versus, versus having to go and, and buy multi-million dollar softwares and own them and bring them in house and then load them on equipment. You can just subscribe to these services and connect them into your enterprise and get immediate value from them. Mm. But there are that your bigger companies that, you know, your fortune 500 are still strapped with pretty significant tech debt. Interesting. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like a form of sunk cost. Oh, definitely. In terms of how to think about sunk cost from an economic value standpoint. And, you know, when the, the wires are laid and the software is installed and the trainers are trained and, you know, <laughs> the, thinking about unraveling all of that is probably a pretty daunting thought process. And today we just want to get to the outcome. We just yeah. want the trained person that can work the process that can help us get more widgets out faster, help us provide a better customer experience. And that time just took longer and longer and longer when we kept adding things onto it. But now everything you can just about receive about any software you need is software as a service. Somebody else is maintaining the update. Somebody else is maintaining the equipment. Right. You're just getting what you need, which is the value out of the, out of the platform. Yeah, well said. So we've kind of unpacked your definition of what it is, of what innovation is, talked a bit about what it isn't. Is there any advice that you would have for innovators out there? Uh, definitely. Don't be afraid of it, for one. If you're in a company and you see lots of opportunities for innovation, but it isn't necessarily your role. I would say find people that are good coaches in the organization that are eager for change, have, um, have a good reputation um, for communication and collaboration within the company and, and seek them as, um, as sponsors. Mm -hmm. Could be very well that your idea or ideas or your ability to sort of help um, experiment and test could create a new role or opportunity for you because many companies haven't figured this out. Right. Depending upon your industry, you know, whether you're R&D centric or you're sort of B2C sort of consumer centric, um, they're just, they're in the fight. You know, they're in the battle. They're scrapping every day. They're not really thinking about some of the ways that they could really change the paradigm. So if you are an innovative thinker, I would say, uh, depending upon where you are in the organization, if you're already in leadership, then you should, you know, have a pretty easy path to getting your voice heard. And then just have Good, clear definitions. It, again, it doesn't always have to be return on investment, but given the climate we're in, you're going to need to know that if you're going to be asking for money, that there needs to be some path to uh, return. Mm -hmm. But you can also do things like mitigate risks or get access to new customers or take business away from your competitors. You know, If you can clearly make a case that those things uh, could be a great result as your innovation, you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to be heard mm -hmm. because CEOs and CIOs, CTOs, CFOs, um, chief strategy officers, uh, they're looking for any way to compete right now, any way to rise above the noise. Right. And it's going to take innovation to help them get there. So I'd say re regardless of where you are in the organization, just seek that sort of a coach that's going to sponsor you to get the right visibility and then go for it. Mm. Tim, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing your point of view, your broad experience across the tech space from Silicon Valley to big Fortune 500s really, I think, has, has given you a unique perspective. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you so much, Jared. It was an honor. I, I uh, was glad to be on the show. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means. <laughs>